forge your inner armor. Welcome to the Inner Armor Podcast with Dr. Timothy Royer, where we explore ways to train our brains and bodies to become dynamically resilient so that we can all, from professional athletes to ordinary people, perform at our potential. Welcome back to the Inner Armor Podcast. We have a special guest today to talk about uh, something that is sort of a follow-up to a series we've been doing. We've been talking a lot lately about autonomic nervous system regulation, or ANSWER. And we've been talking about the various ways that nervous system dysregulation manifests itself. But one way that we see in terms of extremes on that regulation scale is a condition that is known as autism. And today we have a leading expert in the field to discuss it with us. So, Doc, you and uh, our guest are both joining us by phone today as you're traveling. So do you want to introduce maybe what's going on, where you are, where she is, and kind of set it up? Yeah. And if uh, our listeners feel like they're listening to us on a phone call, they are. Uh, (laughs) um, Dr. Libertor is in uh, New York City, and I am in Minneapolis because it's the day before the 49ers Vikings game, which is kind of a torn thing for me, because as you all know out there, I've been working with Kirk for 13 years, but also works 49ers. So it's going to be a tough night cheering. Yeah, I'm conflicted tonight about knowing who to cheer for. So I'm just going to cheer for both sides to yeah, <laughs> to win, but I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> and then uh, Greg, you're in... I'm in Michigan. Michigan. And back in the so back, I'm, I'm, I'm hiding in the studio here in a darkened yeah. studio. And so, yeah. but here we all are. Yeah. So it's great to have Dr. Lisa Libator with us today. And we met a couple of years ago now. Wow. That's gone past Lisa. And we met through a mutual professional acquaintance. And as everybody probably out there know, I've, I was a division chief of pediatric behavioral medicine at a large children's hospital for a number of years. So we developed the first autism clinic at that hospital. I did with a couple of my colleagues, and I've always had a deep passion and drive to help this population and their families. And I heard about what you were doing through this mutual acquaintance and about your story. And Amy, my wife, and I came up to visit you and to see one of the homes that you do. And I was completely blown away, (laughs) completely blown away. And since then, you and I have uh, started this journey together. So before kind of explaining all of that myself, I'd rather kind of the audience to get to know a little bit about you, your journey. Could you just kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Royer. Well, my name is Dr. Lisa Libertori. My husband and I are both physicians. My husband's Dr. Dimitri Casares. We've been together since we're 18 years old, went to medical wow. school, college and medical school together. And I tell people that I think all of that <laughs> prepared us for what would become a marathon of raising. The marathon endurance, I think you need to uh-huh. raise an autistic child because it is really a marathon and little baby steps and ups and downs along the way. And we were going about things, I think, step by step, whatever the milestone was that Michael was having challenges with. Michael is now actually turning 26 next oh. next month. Yeah. And for parents who have children who are newly diagnosed, I would say that for most of the time, you just have to focus on what the the challenge is at that time in that child's life and not try to think too far in advance. So when Michael was um, 17, that's when I had the aha moment that, oh my goodness, you know, four more years, he's going to be in this school, which is a loving environment. And Michael is really happy in that school, but he would only be there for four more years. And when I asked other parents, the other, the principal of the school, well, what's happening with that person who's graduating? What's happening with that person's graduating? She said, oh, we don't, you know, we don't know. We're going to, we're going to try to figure this out. And I said, oh, my God, figure this out. Now, Michael is pretty, I mean, you know, the classification talking about, you know, using the word profound autism really to describe Mm -hmm. the level of need that the individual has. So I wouldn't say it has to do with intelligence. It has to do with more Mm -hmm. with the need. So because Michael has 
poor expressive language, it's much harder for him to communicate his needs. And normal, a young adult, a teenage boy, without the ability to communicate what was happening to his body, led to pretty severe behavior challenges. Mm. And that was a pretty tough time in his life. And we've just, again, tried to help Michael. And then by helping Michael, try to help other families. Because if we're struggling with this, and we're both two doctors with access to so much, I just couldn't imagine how other families were dealing with it. So that's what really prompted us to start our first nonprofit, which is Love Michael. And Love mm-hmm. Michael focuses on giving people on the spectrum meaningful work and really trying to tap into what their talents are and to kind of double down on that. And for Michael, it was cooking. And so that's why we started gotcha. Love Michael as a, a bakery, a bakery that makes granola. And we still, that's still in operation. It was founded in 2015. And wow. we have a flagship bakery in New York City. We have about 20 employees. And they make granola, they package granola, and they ship out granola actually to as a thank you to people who've taken the time to become educated about the plight of autistic adults. Because it really, it really is not very good for autistic adults. Mm-hmm. There's like a 90% unemployment, underemployment, 400% higher suicide rate. I mean, it's pretty scary when you look at the, the statistics. So, you know, that's how we still dealt, dealt with work. But the bigger challenge is where is everybody going to live and who's going to be there to care for Michael and his colleagues when we're no longer around? And that's really right. what brought us to create the homes. And that's what you came to visit. And uh, yeah, I tell people, you have to feel it. You have to come see it. It's really hard to explain. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about, because I want to get into the homes, but the the Love Michael project is so, it's just so amazing. These different things that you've done or been a part of and other people have joined you in this process and gathered kind of people around you. Mm-hmm. How did you, like, you were working with Michael trying to find different things how did you land in the in the bakery him liking that and then into granola of all things i mean of all the different well, things like you know like, tell me um, a little bit more about that sure sure um so we when he was so when he was 17 like i said we were trying to figure out what he could do and when i was i was confronted with we're gonna have to figure this out he was good at a lot of things, but he was really good at, at being like a prep chef. Like he would help me all the time in the kitchen. And it was always easier for me to just have my holidays at my house because going to someone's house, inevitably they would invite us and I would just be in the basement reading a book to Mike or doing puzzles at Mike. I'm like, why do I need to go to your house mm-hmm. to sit in the basement? You know, I'd rather do it at my house. And at least when Michael wants to take a break, he has everything he needs in the, in the house And But what happened was my other son, Alexander, who's one year older than Mike, he was not really that interested in helping out in the kitchen. (laughs) Mike was. Mike's like chopping all this sweet potatoes, (laughs) peeling everything. I mean, then we started volunteering at our church. And uh, that was was actually what solidified it for me because we went to volunteer at the church. They were making Uh um, something called moussaka. My husband is of Greek descent. And Uh we belong to a Greek Orthodox church in Southampton. And I asked them if they would help set up a state, set up a station for Mike that we wanted to come volunteer. So they had the whole station set up, you know, eggplant, and then you dip it in egg and breadcrumb, and then you put it on the tray. And Michael was so excited. You know, he had his little oh, so headphones cool. on and he started yeah. to do it. And at the end, he wouldn't take a break. I'm like, Mike, 15 minutes, take a break. So, so they said, Lisa, I can't. You don't know how helpful this was. This would have taken us three days, what Michael did in one day. Wow. That is so cool. Yeah. So then I said, well, okay, you know what? This is what it's going to be. I tried to get him enrolled in um, a school uh, for cooking. And the because, you know, I had a, a patient of mine who knew the head chef. And I brought photos of him, video of him cooking in the kitchen and the church. And he goes, you know what? You're right. He really has a lot of skill here, but I wouldn't know how to work with somebody on the spectrum, the liability. But I'm going to have an idea. There's a woman who graduated from our school. She just had a baby. She needs something, alternative job. Why, why don't we see if she'll come and just start in your house? I said, all right, that sounds a good, a good idea. Like, so Sarah, I took told the teacher, the principal, listen, I'm going to take Mike out of school two days a week. 
you know, he's not, he knows how to make a bed. <laughs> he doesn't need to, you know, like it was really becoming babysitting at that point. Uh-huh. And so she came to the house and we set up our kitchen like a home, like a, like you would in a restaurant. And she treated him, did the curriculum that she would learn in school. And she said, you know, he's really, really good. And I said, well, you know, I don't want him to be alone. I want him to work with other people. Why don't we make like a little home business, maybe grow a little business and teach mm-hmm. Mike some gratitude because, you know, he's making food, he's eating it. Let's make something, you know, give it to Yaya, give it to grandma, you know, and sign it. He would sign it, love Michael. So that's how we're like, you know, this is a cute little business. Why don't we make, just chef, chef said, if you want other people to work with him, I would suggest granola because there's no knives involved in the process. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So you could teach all the skills, you know, weighing, measuring, mixing, rolling, cracking, packaging. You think about it. There's a sense of you could complete it in one shift, which that si- sense of completion is so important. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, there's no knives. So that's really how we started formulating the granola. We weren't thinking about making a granola that was affordable. <laughs> it was <laughs> like, let's use the best ingredients, all organic, gluten-free, dairy-free, because Michael did follow, does follow, and did follow that kind of diet. And so we ended up with this really amazing, uh, high-quality granola because Sarah is a trained pastry chef. She actually... Um, left uh, a couple of years ago to to do her passion, which is to open a pastry shop in the south of France, you know? So that's our granola. Wow. <laughs> and we still make that, you know, that's the granola. That's the recipe. We actually have two flavors. Originola, which is kind of like a pumpkin spice flavor, and mm. mocha, which is more like an espresso mocha. They're not, they're high, but low glycemic index. You know, we really wanted to make something that, I felt very strongly if you see children and young adults with autism between medication and the use of food as a reinforcer for mm-hmm. behaviors is a lot of obesity. And that's really something that I feel very important that we are mindful of. Yes. And I, this granola <clears throat> that you're talking about is like manna from heaven. I mean, it is, <laughs> it is just some good, mm-hmm. good stuff. We stock it in our cupboard. And at my, one of my kids' weddings last year, we, we, we yes. gave it out to all the different people. So sweet. And yep. it was, I mean, it's just such a, a neat, it's so at a micro level, you know, this is what a psychologist does, right? You know, yep. I, I look at all the patterns, right? Yeah. At a micro level, what you're, what you did with the granola is kind of at a macro level, what you're doing with the homes It's like, yes. it's high quality. It's engagement and ownership that these guys are doing and girls, ladies are doing Mm -hmm. and, you know, empowering them. Also thinking about nutritionally, how it should be, what should be the ingredients, you know, uh, in life in a sense. So I'm I'm not surprised about uh, the autism home is just at a bigger level what you've done. Can you just for our listeners... Man, well, you and I could talk about this for a long time. Right, right. But, but for our listeners, let's just back up just a smidge, okay? And, you know, there's so much that we hear about autism. Mm-hmm. And it's growing in d- diagnostics and those kind of things. And mm-hmm. sometimes there's kind of this use of the word that you'll find somebody who's, you know, pretty high functioning, doing all kinds of things, you know, a college student doing, you know, everything and, you know, doesn't look, you know, very different than somebody else. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about profound autism, we're talking more about the behaviors and this, the inability to, to communicate and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Can you, just for our listeners, can you kind of give us just what your, how you see it, this kind of Mm -hmm. spectrum, spectrum of autism, which almost I would, I feel it's kind of gotten so broad that it's hard to even understand what it is we're talking about. So can yes. you help us a little bit? Yes. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think that I'm, I think about this all the time. 
because I don't think that there's a good definition still. And so I there's a famous phrase that's always used around in the autism world, which is, if you know one person with autism, you know one person with autism. Yes, yeah. And so, and parents are so hyper-focused on trying to provide the best life for their own son or daughter that they know that one son or daughter. And they right. categorize everybody in terms of what their own experience. And and I was no different. I only really knew Michael. I have a, well, I know Michael and I know my nephew. My sister's son is also on the spectrum. Christian, who actually lives with Mike. Christian is very different than Mike. I mean, they couldn't be two more different people. Michael is nonverbal. Christian is the most engaging and verbal. Michael, you know, needs, really has a hard time with any change. Christian you know, can communicate so he can work through those things. I mean, Michael is hyper athletic and competitive. Christian is not. Christian is like a, you know, casually row the boat in Central Park with a girlfriend, you know, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, so exactly. they're very different. And so I, one time when Michael was, when, when we were starting Love Michael, I went back to the school and I said, I want somebody to work with Mike because we had, we had moved out of our home into a place called Entrepreneur Kitchen which is a place that mentors small businesses. I mean, my 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 story is a really a blessed project, I have to say, because every step along the way, it's like the next person came into my life, which was at the right time. So I went back to the school and I said, I've got this place, Entrepreneur Kitchen. I want Michael to work with somebody who graduated, who's looking for a cooking job. So they introduced me to Jonathan. Now I knew Jonathan because Jonathan was like the life of, the, of all the parties. I said, Jonathan, do you want to come work? He said, Lisa. I want to cook so badly, but they have me peeling potatoes for three group homes. He goes, I don't want to peel potatoes the rest of my life. I'm getting dumber by the day. Now, this is an autistic young man, extremely different than Michael. You can, we were actually had a, because I was a a guest on CBS for like ENT work. I'm an ear, nose and throat doctor. So, so I, I was talking to the CBS woman who was interviewing me for something stupid, like, this breathing in candle smoke irritate the nose. I'm like, <laughs> could you please do a story about something important? And as we're talking, you know, because you have to walk down yes. the hall and pretend you're talking to her. So would you please do a story on what we're doing with Love Michael? So she she actually did a story. And Jonathan, if you can still see CBS, Jonathan's got his arm around Michael. Michael's got the biggest smile because Jonathan is the mouthpiece for what we're trying to talk about. Uh-huh. And when we, when I would pick up John, Jonathan lived in a group home because his parent is a long story, but Jonathan lived in a group home and I would pick him up at his meeting spot to take him to the kitchen because when you're in group home, you can only do what everybody does. There's no individualized, like I work mm-hmm. here, you work here. Everybody worked at the greenhouse. So I had to go out of my way to get Jonathan to be able to bring him to the kitchen. And he said, Lisa, I know why you want me because I'm high functioning. And I said, you know, really? Jonathan... I really don't like that word. He said, why? I said, I, he goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, no, no, I, it's what people say. I said, but what is high functioning, low functioning? Here's Michael. He's actually, well, how would you say he's in the kitchen? Better than me. Like, okay. He's a black diamond skier. He's a competitive rower. He can do all these things, but he cannot communicate verbally. Does that make him low functioning? No, 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 I'll never do that again, Lisa. I said, I think we say higher need, or lesser need. So yeah. that helps communicate what the staffing support. And when we do our homes, when we talk about the staff, we say, okay, Mike's going to need help with this, this, this. This one person's going to need help with this, 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 this. But we try, I I really don't, I, I really try to help people to try to change that language. Low functioning, high functioning, I think is is really not a nice way to be labeled and it really doesn't do justice to respecting the person, giving the person the respect and the dignity that they deserve. So I say low need or higher need so that we can communicate the needs to keep somebody safe in a home or in the community. Oh, I think that is just a phenomenal concept, the high need, low need, because you've sent me, <clears throat> I've seen some videos mm-hmm. of Michael, Michael skiing, okay? Mm-hmm. And I am a low functioning Skier. Okay. <laughs> what Michael does, yeah, what Michael does on the slopes 
is insane. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. yeah. And the thing about it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, he's in all of his gear and it's a, it's a video of you sending it and everybody else, he's flying by everybody else and just screws along. And, mm-hmm. and if you don't know his story, you're like, wow, I want this guy to teach me to ski. You know, like he's, That's right. he's over the top. And then the, the other thing that we ran into, if you wouldn't mind, I mean, we haven't even got to the yep. homes yet. We might have to do that at a different mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk about the rowing? Like it, it is so cool. Can you the rowing is phenomenal, and actually, yeah. this 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 weekend, it's very timely. So Michael's brother rowed in high school for Shamanad, an old boys uh, Catholic high school here in in Long Island. And Michael, we have to drag Michael to those regattas, and Michael literally ran into the water one day. He's like, you know, basically dummies. I want to do this too. So again, it doesn't it doesn't exist. It didn't exist. We had to create the program with kind, willing to work with you people. I mean, you need people around you that are willing to say yes, and we'll do this together. And that's, that's really the secret to anything. You can't do it alone. You have to do it with people. And you have to do people who are open minded and know that there's going to be some bumps in the road, like, get over it. The first day may not be okay. It may take months. So Michael started training when he was 14. And he trained indoors from, I remember from November to March. And he got into the water for the first time in April with his rowing buddy, Molly, who was a freshman at that time. And she she trained with him every day, even though she trained on her own rowing team with the girls, the girls JV team. She yeah. rowed with Michael and they competed at the head of the school co in Philly that year in October of that year, just, just starting to row. And they brought home the first silver trophy and they medaled they got first place but they brought home that you know cup the first cup that port rowing ever got this so is fast, a four, this is this 14? Was at 14 years old oh my and goodness. so fast forward now he he rode for six years for them and then had to take a break for for various reasons it's a rowing is it could be a whole topic itself but rowing changed him rowing the school said is michael on medication and i said no He's just rowing every day. And they said, this is, this is incredible. I think because of the self-esteem, the feeling of accomplishment, the physical nature of rowing, the water, et cetera, et cetera. So fast forward now, we connected in Sag Harbor with the community rowing program in, 20, in uh, 2021. And again, a willing, a willing coach who was willing to try it as long as he had this our support. And we've got now Michael, Eric, and Sheridan. These are three residents in the U.S. Autism Homes program out in Southampton. are competing Saturday and Sunday in Philadelphia at the head of the school call. No way. With their rowing um, partners who are their direct support professionals who we got trained to row. Unbelievable. So they're in a competition, men, Mm -hmm. like they're national competition so they'll they'll be rowing on saturday morning in a double and michael with claude and you know claude oh, oh my goodness <laughs> so claude awesome. is you know six foot something haitian man with long dreadlocks looks like an nfl football player yes, he does. not the yeah, body type of a, a typical rower and he and mike are in one boat sheridan and lane are in the second boat elaine johnson and eric <gasps> and scott Scott are in the third boat. So they're all entered into the 8, 8 a.m. Saturday morning race. And then on Sunday, they're entered into a quad. And each of them will be joined by two elite rowers out of Philly who are going to join them in that competition. Unbelievable. I know. I know. This so we're going to videotape the whole thing. And, you know, hopefully whatever happens, happens. They are they're going there to medal. They are not going there to paddle <laughs> around in the water. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah. Well, if I know Michael, Michael's yeah. up for 110 percent. Yes. I mean, when he in, he is into it and he yeah. goes so hard. Yes. And, you know, I got to wonder, like, I think of this freshman, is it Molly? Yes. Yeah. Like, what's that like for her as part of her life story, right? That she spent probably hours. Oh, 
I mean, Mike. thousands and thousands of hours. She she can in as she became a varsity rower, she still rode with Mike. And then of course she got a full scholarship to Boston College. And wow. you know, it's Molly, you know, I, I we, actually I feel sad, you know, that we're we're not in touch. We Molly, maybe she hears it. <laughs> well, Facebook, we should be able to get in touch, but it's really funny. It does change. It it is transformative for the for the rowing buddy. And we have a young man yeah. now rowing with our guys, a uh, high school student, Miles uh, Barrowcliffe, who's here in Sag Harbor. He also has a brother on the spectrum who is nonverbal, who is nine or 10 years old. So I was very impressed that he was willing to commit the time to row with our guys because, you know, it's it's hard when you're a sip. And I, I didn't appreciate it as much as I do now mm-hmm. because, you know, we know that our kids are have so much, you know, to be thankful for, you know, just having parents who are together, not, you know, right. um, yeah. having, you know, all the things that Alexander, his other brother had. It was it was hard to sort of, you know, kind of uh, give him the opportunity to kind of grieve in some ways, not having what other brothers and sisters had as a relationship and many things that we, we just wanted what other families would consider normal. Right. Like going to a restaurant and being able to stay through the meal without having a situation or, you know, Alexander, Alexander definitely had his childhood. He took the back seat, And I, I think that's another thing for young parents to realize is that the other brother or sister has to have some alone time and it, they have to, it, it, it is something to recognize. And, and that's another reason why I work so hard to try to organize U.S. autism homes. The home model is because I want the brothers and sisters to understand we want them part of their lives, but it's not going to be their primary responsibility to be their caregiver for the rest of their life. Because that's a, you know, that's a big ask for a brother and sister. Absolutely. And you, I have a a very close family friend who has a son is about high needs like Michael Mm -hmm. is. And, Mm -hmm. and I, and he's a little bit older than Michael. And, you know, I know their entire life while the family is, you know, very adventurous and wants to do things, you know, they, because of his certain needs, and I know Michael can travel and stuff, but, Mm -hmm. but they haven't been really, you know, able to to go many places outside of their, you know, couple mile radius, their entire life yep. as a family yep. and, and the sibling, same, same way, right? Exactly, you know? exactly. And, and the, the impact that that has negatively, but also positively too. I mean, I know that's, that's probably hard in the moment or years in the moment, mm-hmm. but there's got to be a certain aspect of that too that, you know, has to, grows you up really fast. You know, if you're not, it's hard to just be a kid or be an adolescent because you've got a sibling who, mm-hmm. you know, has high needs and mm-hmm. your needs are going to be put in the back seat figuratively. Mm-hmm. Um, but this whole, I think what you've done <clears throat> and we're going to, let's put, hopefully we can connect with you again, because I want to, we really want to hit the U.S. autism, the U.S. autism homes. But I want to kind of finish up on this concept of this, while the world is trying to put everybody into boxes, right? You know, and Mm -hmm. this box is over there doing its thing. And you've alluded to this, and we'll probably talk more about this in U.S. autism homes, but you hit a certain stage of development that Michael's box was going to drive him into a living situation that he was just going to get all boxed in, Mm -hmm. right? But kind of like you did with the granola is you, you broke the model and said, wait a minute, let's pull in people that aren't in that box to be part of Michael's mm-hmm. life. You know, the cooking and the rowing and and we're, we're going to learn about how you partner with these other organizations when they become adults. But that community, I mm-hmm. when I've seen from an outside is people that have interacted with the community almost get more out of that than the actual individual, you know? Yes. You know what I'm saying? I mean, can you absolutely kind of speak to that a little bit? Like we, we think, well, we're going to come in and do all this work. And I've learned this in my field, not just in the area of autism, but 
I learn more from my patients and watching their resiliency and the things they go through and come out on the other end than I think I can ever do for them. Mm -hmm. And I think Michael is kind of like impacting the world in such a different way, you know, and stretching people further. Can you kind of speak to that as we kind of? Yes, I think that that's that's exactly what's happened here in Southampton. Why we decided to, to do the homes in Southampton was because of the community that we have here in Southampton, starting with the church. And, you know, people have various relationships with their with religion and et cetera. But at, at the heart, at the most the beautiful side of of a faith based community is the community and having a, an extension of your nuclear family. Yes. And and Father Alex and Father Constantine are the head priests in our church out in Southampton, especially Father Alex. He we met him when Michael was 40 days old. He did the 40 day blessing and he did wow. baptism. Okay. And they have actually walked alongside us through the journey, the ups and downs. And we've had some really challenging years. And they came to visit Michael where he was and when he was and said, Michael, we love you. Like we, we're praying for you. We we love you, Michael. And the hugs that Michael will reciprocate, he knows that the love there. So it was it all it only made sense to ask them, we have this idea of having a group of homes with a faith-based supportive community in an interdenominational way. It wasn't about pre- pushing any one religious agenda. It was mm-hmm. having other people experience this loving community and a commu- and a and a, an organization that wants to be a pillar in the community. So they they open the doors um sometimes to doors that are closed. Yeah. And when Father and I asked Father Constantine and Father Alex, if they would join the board of the nonprofit. And Father Alex said, I'm going to join the advisory board because I want you to know it means something. Father Constantine is on the board. And when I hear Father Constantine speak to other clergy, because we do want to inspire other people to do what we're doing here, we can't possibly open, you know, I don't want to open, you know, 20 homes. You know, right now we have four, we're probably going to go to six and then stop because we want to have that individualized you don't want it to feel like an institution model, right? right? Yeah. So what he says to other clergy people is that you you really, really should consider this. It has been transformative to our community to be involved in the Love Michael U.S. Autism Homes Project. For some of the, the women who come and volunteer, and there's lots of volunteers, they say it's the best day of their week. And it's cre- it's created an extension of like a protective circle of people around our young men and women, so that I know if if any of the guys need something, mm. and uh, say their staff, you know, something happened to the staff, they we're, we're short of staff for some reason. There's like twenty twenty five people I can call upon and say, hey, wow. Melina, would you go over there? Or hey, Father Constantine, can you pop by? It's it's like an extension of aunts and uncles and cousins and et cetera, et cetera. So it's brought, it's brought the youth to the church because the youth really like to see this kind of work and, and they get involved volunteering. It's increased the church's stewardship because all mm-hmm. these families have joined because they're so grateful. It's increased the fundraising for the church because people really like to see an active ministry that looks like it's beyond the, the, the typical you know, church fundraising. So it, it is a win-win. And then kind of that's that's really what I want to do is have, and, and we talked about this, I want to have a conference next September to be able to show all the components of at least what we've learned up to this point because, you know, it's still a journey. It's awesome. It's awesome. I, you know, when I first experienced you, experienced the homes and then I went to the church and I was just reminded of, the passage in the Bible that says, you know, to the least of these, right? Mm-hmm. And how the church is is really called to that. Mm-hmm. And but then I'm trying to figure out who is the least of these because it's, many times it's us mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that absolutely that, that have have lower needs, mm-hmm. but we are inundated with so much stuff that we can't be present and can't be involved in helping other people, and so. We had a longer discussion, but let's finish up because I, I but I want to do, hopefully we can get you again, because mm-hmm. I want to really dive into the U.S. Autism Homes 
and our experience, you know, you talk about, I, it will always be just ingrained on my memory that day that I walked in on the Memorial Day picnic at one of the homes mm -hmm. and the first four people that met me, like I couldn't even, I barely opened the gate and yeah. right in front of me were these four guys shaking my hand and introducing themselves. And I can still see their faces. I'm like, what is this? Yeah. What, what, is, what has happened here? What is this place? And I, mm -hmm. I really want to have our listeners, I want to dive into this because, you know, I think it's another extension of the granola, the rowing, you know, the involvement in the community. I mean, it's just, you, you've kind of broken the model here that I think is the model that's not really getting us as far as we can go and shown a different way to do this. So it's, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast and to help people out there understand more and what you're doing. So thank, thank you, you, Lisa. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anytime. I, I appreciate it. And we'll, we'll connect again. Tell Michael I said hi. And hey, we're rooting for you guys, for them this weekend. Mm -hmm. And then everybody out there that's listening, reach out to Love. How, how do they get a hold of some? Of love, love Michael. Love Michael. L-U-V Michael dot org. And uh, you can find out more about our programs that we offer. Again, a big part of what we do is think about the granola as a thank you or Michael's, Michael's gift to, to the world for being a kinder, more um, inclusive place. So that's really what, that's really what the granola is about. And you can read more on our website. Yeah, that's awesome. So inspiring. Thanks again. You're welcome. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. This has been the Inner Armor Podcast. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Would you please follow or subscribe and make sure to leave us a review or comment. You can learn more about Inner Armor, Dr. Royer, and how to perform at your potential by going to forgeinnerarmor.com.